Okay. The work on fostering action at the subnational level, I'm delighted to say, was uh, coordinated, facilitated by my excellent colleagues at EuroHealthNet, and I had the pleasure of enjoying the benefit of the learning. And uh, a, a new network was established of subnational partners and players who really worked extremely hard during the course of the three years to again produce a whole range of outputs which are either in uh, tangible form on the equity action stall outside or are all put online and linked into WHO databases, European Commission approaches, etc. So we're going to explore what are the prospects and opportunities for taking forward that because we, EuroHealthNet have always recognised the work at all levels is absolutely essential. One without another can't succeed. And again, in another very brief announcement, we can announce the new creation of Health Promotion Europe from 2014 that all subnational and national bodies who are responsible and accountable for work in these fields uh, can increasingly participate in again to make sure the learning from equity action uh, has functions to take forward work on social determinants and health inequalities. So I'm delighted to invite our three expert speakers to comment on their perspectives uh, on what can be done and again we'll open the floor for questions then. So first of all, can I be uh, particularly delighted to welcome Michael Ralph, who is the advisor for the Regional Directorate at the European Commission, again showing that the European Commission is working intersectorally and multisectorally to tackle these cross-cutting issues. Michael, we're very delighted to welcome you again. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I'll go straight into the subject. The, the structural funds have been mentioned uh, by a number of the, of the previous speakers. This is a very good time actually to have a discussion on this. Uh, the service I represent in the Commission, which give its full title, is the Director General for Regional Policy and, and Urban uh, Development. Uh, we are, are very, very busy at the moment together with our colleagues from other relevant Commission services, particularly, for example, from uh, employment, also our colleagues in Sanko as far as health is concerned. Uh, we are very busy working, discussing, negotiating with our partners at national, regional and local level uh, the next round, which is starting this year, of the structural funds. I suppose those of you of some familiarity with structural funds know they work on a, on a multi-annual basis, so this is, we're actually talking about the content of, of programs for the next uh, seven, uh, seven to ten years, um, so this is a very important time. There are some important opportunities for, for health inside these. Uh, I'm not in three or four minutes going to give you an encyclopedia about this. I'll, I'll give you some uh, headlines on uh, a little bit some of, the, uh, some of the relevant things that different funds can do. Uh, what I think you've mainly asked me to do is to answer three things. First of all, how can the funds be used better? Uh, that's a very important question. Uh, what are the hurdles to be overcome and also what some of the opportunities are which exist. So I'll try to make sure my comments basically uh, cover, cover those questions. Um, just to be very clear to start off with what we're talking about at the moment, we're negotiating programs. Uh, the Commission isn't the responsible uh, body for actually implementing these programs uh, and the projects and the measures. This is a real subsidiarity exercise. This is something which is done by the member states, by the regions, uh, by, the, by, by, by the beneficiaries. We discuss basically the strategic priorities uh, we're to be putting in the programs. That's what we're doing at the moment. There's also a financial solidarity. It's a policy for uh, the whole territory of the European Union. There's obviously a financial solidarity. Uh, there is a concentration of financial resources in uh, less developed regions. Uh, this isn't new. Uh, this means that the needs, this because the needs there are greater, this means that we can actually do more in those countries. This obviously has an impact uh, on a lot of areas, including on health. We can finance on health infrastructure, but we expect our investments, for example, to be mainly in uh, the less developed regions. What can we do better? First of all, I'll go back to one or two of the things which were said in the previous panel, which I think are very important because there was a lot of discussion about stakeholder involvement. This is a very important principle about how the funds work. We have what we call partnership principle, which talks about bringing in different layers of public authorities. It talks about bringing 
bringing in social partners, economic partners, also representatives of civil society. Uh, a few days ago, the Commission actually adopted a code of conduct on this partnership principle, which we're waiting for action from the Council at the moment, basically to give some kind of focus on how this could be uh, well done. So that's one thing. Another thing that was mentioned on the previous uh, panel was cross-sector approaches. This is very important. We're fighting silo thinking. Um, first of all, the different funds, and I'm going to talk about European Social Fund, European Regional Development Fund, they need to work together, they need to be put together at the local level so that we can really uh, get an overall uh, approach and, uh, and enhance effectiveness from them. We need to look at different uh, the way health, for example, interacts with other sectors. There was mention of the Roma. This has come up on a number of uh, interventions already today. That's one area of vulnerable groups we're looking at. And in fact, we have a communication which is being worked on that in the Commission for uh, uh, later this uh, spring. Uh, and um, the, there we have a cross-sector approach. So we take health as an issue there, but also education, employment, housing. All these things need to be taken together. So that's some of the things already we're trying to do best. Uh, opportunities. Uh, I'll start with the social fund. Uh, that's got one of its primary objectives, promoting social inclusion, combating poverty. So that can include, as far as health is concerned, improving access to health services. It can include health prevention measures, targeted actions on uh, vulnerable groups. When we get to different issues like uh, social determinants of health, it can do a lot of things help, for example, finance promoting healthy lifestyles. I know the things you were talking about here. So this can cover physical activity, smoking, alcohol abuse, etc., etc. This can come under the ESF. And some of the classic areas of intervention deal with employment and education. That's where the, the, the main emphasis of that fund is. So these are obviously really some of the, the major determinants which we were, we're hearing about. ERDF finances uh, health infrastructures. Uh, it's part also of promoting social inclusion and combating poverty. What we've put in our regulations, these have to do three things, first of all. They have to contribute, obviously, to territorial development. This is a regional development instrument. That's logical. I think it's very important to see that the contribution for health infrastructures is very much embedded in economic and social development in general. That's one thing. Well, secondly, it's got to contribute to reducing inequalities in terms of health status. So that's another criterion. So the motto here is poor regions, but also poor people. So we could focus on, I was talking about focusing on less developed regions where maybe health infrastructures are not optimum, but we also need to look at the pockets of the vulnerable groups as well. And we also need to look also how we can move towards kind of community-based care. So I've got one minute left. That allows me to talk about some of the hurdles. First of all, and these are, I'll give you three, and these are basically linked to that general uh, orientations of the way we want to run the policy over the next seven years. Uh, so they're not health specific, but they are relevant. First of all, there's a hurdle. We have to concentrate resources on key priorities. So, and this is something we've already been discussing with member states. We issued position papers for different countries already in 2012 to make sure resources are concentrated. It doesn't mean that if you look at the regulations and you look at all the, the possibilities that everything is going to be done everywhere. This doesn't really work. It's a difficult discussion, but this is, I think, if you take it fairly uh, sober look at that, I think that's obvious. That's the first thing. Then a second thing, really important, a commission of Borg mentioned this and one or two other mentioned this. This is the issue of strategies. This is really a lesson from the past. What we've seen, a lot of our interventions in the past haven't had a proper strategic basis. Uh, this means they're not necessarily that effective. Projects might be good, might be bad. They might be good, but if they're not embedded in an overall strategy approach, then obviously the effectiveness is uh, obviously reduced. So, a part of the regulatory setup, member states for all the areas, they have to come up with what we call ex-ante conditionality strategies, which will basically be the framework for the, for the interventions that we will propose. And then when we get to the detail of the programs, what's very important, you need then to pin down exactly what it is you're trying to do, what are your specific objectives, what are your targets, what are the indicators for this, so that we can really track this and then we can show that um, there, is, um, uh, there is some genuine progress on this and we can demonstrate that uh, there are results which have been achieved with this. So I leave it at that. That's uh, very much nutshell form and obviously I can come back with any questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.
Michael, thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated. And say, on the stand, the Equity Action Book and the Guide, hopefully giving you some detailed good examples and some ways to pick up which Michael has spoken about. And later on today, you will also hear from the Directorate uh, for Employment regarding the Social Fund and the Social Investment Package, from the Directorate on Research regarding New Horizon 2020 work to underpin this. And of course, we've already heard from the Commissioner and John Ryan about the work that SANCO are doing linking into the whole approach on the Health Action Programme and Health Strategy. So an integrated strategic effectiveness approach from the European Commission, but of course we need people working effectively in communities and the representation has already been raised by the stakeholder group so we're delighted to welcome a representative of communities. Constant Hanafi is Vice President of the European People's Party in the Committee of the Regions here uh, and most importantly she has been rapporteur on the report on health inequalities in the European Union that Michael mentioned earlier and we at your health net and he and a number of others were very pleased to take part in the consortium so uh, Constance you're very very welcome this morning thank you very much uh, chairman and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen I want to thank the organizers for their kind invitation here this morning with elected members from the 28 member states the committee of the regions represents Europe's local and regional authorities in the EU policy making process and has been stated I have been the COR Rapporteur on the Commission's recent report on health inequalities. Uh, copies of my opinion and of my report are available at the end of the hall following this meeting and it's also available online. Now this session of the conference is particularly appropriate I think as local and regional authorities and this has been said this morning by previous speakers have a frontline role in addressing health inequalities. Although there is a diversity of subnational governance at European level and the diversity I suppose of health systems across the member states as well local and regional authorities nonetheless play a key role in providing public health services, in health promotion and also in disease prevention. At the same time, other functions and policies of local and regional authorities, and this has been emphasized this morning again, and it's only important, I think, to state it, is such as employment, housing, transport, land use policy, the environment, education, public safety, citizen services, etc., ensure that they are key actors in promoting public health and in reducing health inequalities. I underline in my opinion the need for a constant focus on reducing health inequalities at all levels. That's at EU, at national and at local level and this has been emphasized before this morning. However, I would say it is often our authorities that are taking the lead in addressing inequalities that exist within our cities and our regions. And this is absolutely essential as well because as differences exist as much within our cities and regions as member states as between them. Now the Committee of the Regions agrees that given the well documented range of factors that affect health inequalities they cannot be reduced by the health sector alone and indeed this has been said this morning on a couple of occasions. It requires the introduction and the implementation of overarched integrated strategies across all levels of governance. I think that is the key. Reducing health inequalities will require a commitment from many relevant departments or ministries. Not alone health but it also needs social protection, education, transport, energy, etc. And also from the different level of governances there down. As these offices themselves are often competing for resources and they often become very self-centered in their outlook. So I think it's important that we have this overarching uh, policy. National level strategies can inform the development of regional and local level strategies and vice versa. However, I think it's fair to say that it is often at local level that the crucial intersectoral approaches can be developed. 
and implemented in a targeted and efficient manner and where results can be demonstrated. Furthermore, I strongly believe that it is a precondition that a strong political and organisational leadership is needed to help drive and implement a cross-sectoral commitment to reduce health inequalities and to make a real difference to our communities. While authorities within Member States are responsible for the organisation and delivery of health services, EU policies can greatly contribute to improving those services, and we've just heard about the various funding options that are there. Aside from specific health provisions, the inclusion of health-related actions across a range of EU funding programmes, as has been mentioned, like cohesion, research and innovation is another, education, energy, rural development, and so on, will encourage integrated strategies so that maximum benefit can be gained from the resources available. However, I think it's fair to say that I am concerned and have expressed this in my opinion at the stated lack of capacity of the health systems to bring forward investments to address health inequalities. It is critical, I think, that local and regional authorities and the health systems are engaged in all phases of the European Structural Investment Fund's programme cycle to ensure that health receives prioritisation. The Committee of the Regions very much encourages a wider promotion of resources such as the Equity Action's excellent document on applying the EU structural funds. Everybody should have a copy. And I also underline the need for the well-promoted contact points within the regions and member states. The Committee of the Regions, I want to say, strongly encourages the Commission and authorities within the member states to prioritise extending the Health Inequalities Joint Action and building on its excellent work to date. And to conclude, there are just a couple of points that I want to re-emphasize. I think the need for strong political and organizational leadership in making health and the reduction of health inequalities a priority is needed. Otherwise, competing or more immediate concerns will take precedence. And secondly, and this is a very big worry of mine, the 2014-2020 EU budget programming period has already started, with partnerships agreement being concluded with the European Commission and Member States. Hopefully, I would say, following extensive consultation within Member States. I am concerned, though, that where health has not already been prioritised within these partnership agreements, then I'm afraid it just might be too late. However, I leave you on those thoughts and hopefully what I have said will influence some people. Thank you very much indeed. Thompson, thank you very much indeed for your wise and well-informed opinion setting that out and also your concerns about the urgency of this. So the need for the Irish voice is strong in these panels is to marry up the cross-cutting approach in that document with the practical application as to go out with those two documents today and do something about it now and do some so very strong message there. Thank you very much indeed. Our next presenter is a living example of how to actually do something about it and already the approaches in the country of Sweden have been mentioned by Michael Marmot and others so we're delighted to welcome Elizabeth Ramberg who is the Public Health Director, Department of Public Health in Vostra Gotland in Sweden. Elizabeth, you're very yes. welcome. Thank you very much and good afternoon and thank you for inviting us to this fantastic uh, conference. I would like to tell you our story, our journey to make an actual plan um, and I hope you will find your own copy outside then which look, looks like, the, like this. Um, the plan together towards uh, social sustainability and actions on health equity in Västra Götaland. Um, this is our regional policy, the first political policy in Sweden to reduce health in inequalities. The regional council adopted together towards social sustainability actions on health equity in region Västra Götaland on September 24th. The action plan contains proposals of concrete initiatives and measures. 
This is a political framework document. And so what are the implications of that? Well, steers the work in a clear direction, uh, something that is ap applicable for every stakeholder, but it is not something that will be implemented as a checkpoint. I will tell you briefly about the plan structure. It is about the life course perspective, safe and satisfactory growing up conditions, increased participation in work life, and aging with quality of life. Lifelong learning and healthy living habits are perspectives that follow us, us all through life. We have also situations and actions uh, developed in collaboration with various internal and external collaboration partners, and this is very important for us. It's such as local authorities, employment services, health services, social insurance, the county council, county council and the NGOs. Um, so what is the value of equity action? Our participation in the equity action has given us an added value when we are developing our plan of action. When the actual work will now begin, we although lack a European forum in particular for the implementation and especially monitoring and measuring of the results. We would love to see such a forum where we can share our experiences. Um, it is important to develop common goals that we can follow across Europe for a future joint endeavours and for comparability. Political level makes a big difference. The various stakeholders within equity action has different inputs to the project. We feel that the fact that the region Västra Götaland in some questions is an autonomous political actor and not dependent on political decisions at the national level is a strength. Uh, the structural funds, uh, the availability of structural funds varies from country to country. This means that the region like Västra Götaland, which is considered to have better preconditions in terms of, of economy than others, have limited op op opportunities to use the structural funds. But first of all, we have in the equity action very much of inspiration, knowledge and a discussion forum. And uh, at least here is the context that if, if you like to hear more about it, and if you do take off the uh, folkhalsa slash folkhalsa and put slash public health instead you can get it in English it's maybe more easy for you to, to understand what we are writing then so thank you very much Elizabeth, thank you again. Very concise, but a tremendous amount of work has gone into that, and it's very much seen as a very useful model within the Equity Action Group. It's contributed a tremendous amount, but also I know in Irio Ziglio and the Regions for Health uh, work that's been coordinated by the WHO, it's been an important uh, model that has been used within that uh, development in terms of investment for health too. So we're delighted you've been here today from Versa Jutland to give that example, and I hope that stimulates now some inputs from you in the audience comments, questions, good examples of what I'm looking for, and I'm going to come there in the centre and there in the second row, and I'll do my best to bring you all in. Yes, sir. Um, I'm uh, Francesca Voglio from the Regional Care Agency of uh, Puglia Region. I've been involved in this project, and uh, I must admit it was a uh, a very important thing for us, it did make, it make the difference, uh, because we were doing something. We actually invested 20% of our structural funds in, uh, in changing the infrastructure just to uh, widen access uh, to health for our citizens. Uh, but that was something, and as uh, Marmot said before, Professor Marmot said before, we wanted, to do, we wanted to do more. So that pushed basically our governments uh, and decision maker and policy maker uh, to better uh, orient uh, the, um, the investment investment uh, in the new program 2014-2020 in the structural funds. Uh, what we did, we basically introduced the uh, smart specialization strategies uh, as basically uh, a path uh, in, uh, to better focus uh, the investment uh, on the uh, priority of the Europe 2020. And for us, it was an incredible thing because 
this that definitely can make the difference and this make us all citizens in Puglia more optimistic about what we're going to do for the uh, investment structural funds on the issue we're discussing today. Thank you very much indeed, Francesca. Yes, please. Um, Justine Corley from London. Um, I've been involved in the programme and one of the, the, the um, things we've got in London, which is perhaps different from in other regions, is we had um, ESF, in, our, in the ESF programme we had um, health and well-being as cross-cutting theme. And that made a tremendous difference because we could actually see how um, health could be used with employment and education. And one of the programmes, one of the, the case studies that, we, that I actually wrote up in the report um, was a very good example of this um, because it showed how it could work well, um, that, that it was a mentoring scheme for young people. Um, and what it showed was that um, education and health could be, there was less silos and of course that has economic benefits in itself so it's not just a moral case that we educate people better and that we ha have better health but it's an economic case as well and it, 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 it helped um, with um, getting rid of silos um, um, so that was very good um, it, it was the first time that health had been used as a cost-cutting theme um, with sustainability and equal opportunities and I, I suppose for some projects it was a tick box exercise, but it, for, for others it was an absolute great opportunity for um, health to be actually seen as, as part of the whole uh, programme. So that's really important if, it, if all, all European programmes could do the same sort of thing. I think it would be absolutely wonderful. And I think it would cost, it would save so much money as well. <laughs> That always helps. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, sir, please, I'll take you next. Professor Panos Vardas, uh, President of the European Society of Cardiology. I enjoy very much the discussions and the presentations. And I have to confess, as from the side of the European Society of Cardiology, that the inequalities in healthcare in the European Union and the healthcare gaps are huge. This is our view, our estimation. Actions, for sure, are needed. But allow me two, three comments. One, it is clear that the accessibility to the diagnostics and therapeutic techni techniques, at least in the field of cardiovascular medicine in the different European countries, as I said, are very important very significant. The diversity is clear. Just for your information, even the secondary prevention of sudden cardiac death, we are talking here about persons who had died suddenly and they need something very effective, presents huge differences between the European countries. Second point, please don't speak only about the European Union countries. Europe as a, nub, a number of countries that they don't belong to the European Union but are equally significant and large. Take into account, for example, that the implantable defibrillators in Germany related to the secondary prevention is about 300 per million per year and in Russia is only 6 per million per year. And finally, with the highest respect to Professor Marot's uh, talk, from my experience, from my visits, from my discussions in the field of cardiovascular field, in the field of cardiovascular sciences, the gross domestic product per capita is tremendously related to these healthcare gaps. We are talking about Norway with 100,000 gross per capita and Bosnia Herzegovina with five. So the inequalities and the, and the diversities are unavoidable. Thank you very much indeed. That was very helpful and, and I, I'd be very interested personally to follow up with you about how we can talk about using your great resources and reach uh, of your society to bring to bear on those sort of problems. Thank you. I'm going to bring our panellists for an interim reaction. Just 
anything that you've heard that you'd like to comment, I can feel you next to me, Michael, keen to get back and respond. If, if either Elizabeth or Constance want to respond to anything, and then I'm going to try and do one quick round of any further comments before we conclude. This. So, Michael, first, please. Yes, I just wanted to come in and comment on the, what we heard from the, the first two um, uh, speakers from Puglia and from London, uh, because I think they both made some important comments which are also relevant, I think, for the way we uh, uh, we're trying to uh, operate the, the structural funds for the new programming period. Uh, the la lady from Puglia mentioned smart specialization strategies. I don't know whether this is something which everybody knows about here, uh, but this is an important point because um, the over and above what we can do on the infrastructures, uh, we're also putting a major emphasis, and this is going to be a priority everywhere across the board, all regions, uh, innovation, and we're asking uh, regions to come up with, region, with innovation strategies. We call these smart specialization strategies because we want really them to focus and concentrate on key areas. And a number of regions and member states will focus on health. So I very much like what was said because indeed for infrastructures uh, there will, may have been money in the past and there may not be money in the future, but nevertheless uh, those regions that put money on health as one of their uh, innovation areas, they can also tackle uh, important societal challenges. Uh, there has been the uh, Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging, which uh, in Europe you may be aware of, and we can take some of those ideas forward in there, uh, deal with some of the demographic issues, and this is all about developing the ideas for the products and services for, for tomorrow uh, in, uh, in this area. So that's something very important which uh, uh, we also need to bear in mind. And the other thing we also have, I did say at the beginning with the Director General for Regional Policy and Urban Development, I said that wisely because also the urban uh, dimension, I think, of, uh, of our policy is also being enhanced. So I was interested that somebody from London came in on this because we're asking member states to devote a minimum part of their resources for sustainable urban development. And there we want cross-cutting approaches again. So it's, it's bringing together all the various challenges, social challenges, demographic challenges, economic challenges, and we want to finance actions which are part of overall strategies. We can't finance the whole strategies, of course, but we can finance things which are part of that. So those are also very good comments that were made, and I think these are going very much towards uh, some of the other parts of the, the whole vast package of structural funds uh, which, um, uh, which, we, uh, which we're negotiating at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the contributors for their contributions. Yes, I think... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I think it, it has come from this discussion, that there needs to be a focus, I think, on wider disseminating examples of using the structural funds. And I think awareness exists of existing projects that we've heard about and future possibilities. I think they need to be improved uh, through uh, the process of, of, of interaction and disseminating those examples. I think there are a couple of things, I suppose, which uh, bugs me a little. And one of them, been, for instance, there was a reflection undertaken by the member states in the EU Council on sustainable health systems and chronic disease burden. And this could have been enhanced greatly, I think, through consultation with relevant local and regional stakeholders. And this could have been done quite simply via the Committee of the Regions, which has established an interregional group on health. And I think we have an existing monitoring mechanisms within the COR and online platforms that could have been better harnessed as tools to, main, to help mainstream and provide the, 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 the necessary tools for the reduction of health inequalities. And I think my final point would be strategies on the health detriments such as nutrition and obesity and alcohol exist at EU level and they're regularly monitored out there and evaluated. However, I think the European Commission has tended to prioritise interactions with member states and sometimes with civil society holders or stakeholders. However, the Committee of the Regions, representing 28 regional and local authorities throughout Europe, is a forum that could be used where regions and cities can effectively and quickly be consulted on those issues.
and on policy issues and policy formulation. So I think there's a gap that has been neglected and should and could be honed into. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, I think the most of the things have already been said, and I will just emphasize the importance of having the platforms, the, the strategies, and so forth to make this possible in the future, really. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We've got five minutes before we must have lunch, so I'm seeing some hands. I see one there, and then I see the man there and the woman there. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Carolina Kostung, so working for EuroHealthNet, and indeed we have worked with uh, this network of about 30 uh, regional authorities to look at these issues. And we've indeed seen great opportunities, but it is not as easy as it seems, because there are big, large, bureaucratic and complex administrative processes to access these funds. And also we've seen a, a, a lack of awareness really among public health colleagues uh, to uh, uh, effectively access those funds. Uh, I think we have made a great start in the equity action uh, on this. Uh, however, uh, much more needs to be done, and uh, particularly about raising capacity building among public uh, uh, health colleagues uh, uh, out there, but also, I think, uh, with the uh, managing authorities of the structural funds and to make sure that they understand the issue of health inequalities and that health is a real cross-cutting item among uh, uh, the various projects that they may select. So I think um, we've made a start in the equity action, but really uh, a lot uh, needs to be done, and we are not there yet, uh, I think. Thank you very much indeed. The man there, please, sir. Um, my name is Olumide Ogundeji. I'm a general medical practitioner in the UK and also a postgraduate student at the University College London. Uh, my comment is more on two ways, as a strategy and as a question. We've mentioned several times that the social determinants of health and inequalities cuts across all departments. Um, one little idea that comes to my mind is every department within any national government or international organization has in place an induction or some form of a program for civil servants who are starting within the field. It will always be a good idea if there will be some placement for social determinants of health and inequality put into this package of induction so that the language of social determinants of health is picked up as early as possible among politicians, among civil servants, among all who work across the various departments. It's all known that for a child to learn a language or for someone to learn a language, it's easier to learn the language while you're young. And I think this would be a great idea if departments and institutions can take this up in their induction for new staff and new graduates. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take that as a recommendation for all the ministers that are speaking this afternoon and all the commission officials can think about if they're going to introduce it as well. Thank you very much indeed. There was a woman about halfway back. Yeah, can just see. Uh, I'm Bożena Moskalewicz, Poland.